Hey. hey, I want to welcome everybody out to our next Facebook Live. Um, we today are going to be going over thyroid and thyroid disorders, kind of talking through um, some of the blood work that we find to be important for that particular kind of test for looking at thyroid, uh, as well as some of the things that we've found over time and over the years that tend to connect into thyroid. So some of the other things we look at as well. Plus giving you kind of a basic kind of protocol, I guess, or the type of nutrition that we use uh, when we're looking at correcting or working with a thyroid issue, um, and maybe just a couple of results that we've seen. Um, this is a pretty common thing for us to see here in the office. Uh, it's one thing I think a lot of people are just aware of or conscious of. A lot of people come in asking, can we check their thyroid? Can we do a full panel on their thyroid? Um, and the answer is absolutely yes. It's something that I actually we both like working with um, because there's a pretty easy way to track it. There's kind of an easy beginning and end to it. Um, and so you can get things back in order in a relatively short period of time. It still can take a couple months um, if it's a little bit more complicated or been there for a long time. Um, and that's actually, which brings us first to the different type of thyroid type problems. Um, so you do have one of the kind of more, I'm seeing more and more, we're seeing more and more and more talk about ones now is what's called Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune condition to the thyroid. Um, that's one of the ones that is gonna take a little bit longer because you're not just looking at hormone regulation, you're also looking at immune system regulation. Um, so you're looking at both components there. Uh, and then your kind of more traditional is hypothyroidism, uh, meaning you're underproducing thyroid hormones, and then hyperthyroidism, which is, means you're overproducing um, thyroid hormones. In addition to the overproducing, there's also another autoimmune disease that will hike up. With Hashimoto's, it tends to lower. Mm -hmm. Graves' disease yeah. will tend to hike it up. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I just tend to take it upwards. Um, yeah. So uh, thyroid, just to start with, is a gland. It actually sits uh, right here in the throat, the throat area. Um, it is purpose is to produce, or part of its purpose is to produce is what we call T3 and T4 uh, thyroid hormones which actually have an effect on most of the functionings of the body. I'm not sure if there's a system that it doesn't have an, an effect on. It affects uh, metabolism, metabolic rate, which is where people talk about it. Probably most often that's the concern, um, especially when you look at uh, weight, weight gain, people wanting to be able to reduce weight. And if you're running really low metabolism, then that makes it much more difficult to, to be able to do that. Um, and so it also has an effect um, uh, yeah, metabolism, so energy levels, so energy levels of the body, how people feel um, because of that metabolic rate and that component there as effects on digestion. Um, they're finding even those hormones affect uh, the intestinal valves, um, which allows valves to move through. And so when you're looking at kind of constipation issues or even diarrhea issues, like that becomes a possibility. Uh, brain function as well in terms of more along the lines of brain fog, just because of the 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 effects on people's energy and how they feel. And so people will also have that complaint. Skin, people will complain depending on the type of thyroid issue, uh, dry skin is, is a common complaint there. Uh, and then hair loss is probably the other biggest one that we hear. Uh, people will just say, you know, you know, there's a normal hair loss, but then when you start seeing it, you know, more and more and quicker and quicker, um, and I've seen it actually happen for some people in a very short period of time, which you're actually able to visibly see the, the hair loss and, and that is for sure kind of thyroid. You're going to be looking at thyroid. Um, so when it comes to thyroid itself, the, the thyroid blood work that we, that we run, um, which commonly the most common thing run is actually just a basic TSH test. Um, TH, TSH is actually a hormone produced by the pituitary. It sends a signal to the thyroid that tells it to produce the T3 and T4 hormones. So that's kind of the general test, like, in, and um, it's often run um, by itself, which doesn't make complete sense to me, but it does, it's often run by itself. And if it comes back normal in this normal range, um, then people say, oh, it's good, it's not your thyroid, we don't have to look at your thyroid. If you're still matching all the symptoms of a thyroid issue, then those other tests do need to be run. Um, and so TSH as well, something about that, the normal range on that is 0.5 to 4.5 is what's considered the normal reference range. Uh, blood work reference ranges are, are, they've come to, or they came to by actually drawing um, 
by testing the blood of a large set of the population and then creating averages that kind of create this bell-shaped curve. And what they say is that the bottom 2% is considered abnormal and the top 2% is considered abnormal and everything in between is considered uh, to be normal or a healthy range. So it's often not looked at unless it falls outside of that normal range. What's hard with that is everybody's different. Um, so we actually don't know what your thyroid level is exactly supposed to be as well as um, there's no magical thing that happens from 4.5 to 4.6. Uh, the closer and closer you get to that in ranges, um, the more likely that something is going to be off or symptoms are going to be presented. When they go in and test populations of what we would say are health, kind of healthier groups of people or healthy people, uh, they actually do find that you don't really want it to be above two. Um, if anything goes above two, I'm looking at it as a possibility of how is this, why is this off, how is it off, and what's it going into. And idealistically, we actually want it below one. You actually do want it below more of that one to 0.5 range um, for a healthy thyroid level. So that TSH level is a little bit confusing, maybe, or a little bit um, not complete. So the other things we'll run with that uh, here in the office is we will run um, T3, T4, uh, which you get, usually you'll do total and you'll do free T3, T4. And the difference there is yeah. the total amount that's in your blood, the free is the ones that are not bound. So it's your active thyroid. Mm -hmm. So active for thyroid hormones. And then uh, reverse T3. That becomes crucial because you have two hormones. Um, T3 is the actual active hormone. Um, it is three times, four times, four times more effective than T4. And so therefore what happens is the, the body actually produces T4. It has a much longer, uh, you could say, shelf life or it can maintain itself in the body for a longer period of time. T3 is, has a much shorter shorter lifespan. And so the T4 is actually a reserve. So when there's a need, which is consistently happens, um, the body goes through the T3 supply and it needs to convert that T4 into T3 to make it active, to be able to make it usable. Um, and so that's why you actually check that reverse T3 level as you're looking at how well is that happening. And I have absolutely had cases in here, um, the kind of, um, dependent nutrient for that process is called selenium and I have had cases of thyroid issues and individuals even on thyroid medications where their simple addition of selenium um, actually proves to lower the TSH levels regulate thyroid and get the person feeling better simply because their issue was um, they're un in, in a, unable to activate T4 to T3 and so that can be identified reverse T3 back to T3 yeah or reverse T3 back to T3 and so that can be identified uh, there. Um, One other thing yeah. I was going to share with that too. Well, in addition to selenium, you also have zinc. Mm -hmm. uh, those are two minerals that you're absolutely going to need for proper function there. But the other thing is, is you could have complete normal panels for even the total uh, and the free, and then reverse T3 will be off, and people won't look for that. And so what you end up having is a they call it like low thyroid syndrome there's all sorts of names for it euthyroid syndrome um, low t3 syndrome because sometimes the t3 will be low with it but if the reverse t3 is not ran or if you're not knowledgeable on that they'll still continue to have thyroid problems but again it will be missed and like dr quinn said typically it's a selenium issue zinc issue or in addition to that, inflammation. Inflammation will cause that to ramp up real quick. The other thing I was going to touch on really, really quick was um, the reason why it's called T3 and T4. A whole three and four, all that means is how many iodines are attached. Three with T3, four with T4. Cool. I actually didn't know that. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so then, yeah, so then the last blood test, though, that comes in there is um, actually antibody tests. And this is more of a look for the autoimmune type conditions. Um, so you're running actual antibodies tests to the thyroid to see if the body is producing antibodies to the thyroid. If it, they, they are, if that comes back positive, then you are looking at some form of autoimmune condition to, to the thyroid. Um, the additional things that I throw in there, and this is just kind of through clinical experience, um, I haven't seen this too much anywhere else that I've seen a connection. But I've seen a lot um, that usually does couple with a low vitamin D3 test. Um, so anyone I'm suspecting thyroid, I usually run a vitamin D3 test as well. 
The other thing that I've seen very consistently is an actual uh, anemia issues that seem to go with it. Um, again, that's just more clinical, uh, seeing consistently cases and cases of people with a thyroid issue also having an anemia issue. Um, and so I will run uh, total iron, ferritin, and we call a CBC, which gives you uh, white blood, red blood cell count, hematocrit uh, levels, which is another way to identify an anemia. And um, on a rare occasion, I'll run B12, because there is another type of anemia known as pernicious anemia, but usually that can be picked up on the CBC. Um, so those are the other tests that I'll, I'll put in there to go along with those thyroid tests. So, um, so, then, so then once you get all those numbers back, so we have those numbers and that data in here, we talk about it consistently, um, which we actually had an example of it in our last health talk, which we hope to be posting on YouTube before the week's out. Turns out it takes way too long to upload YouTube videos. <laughs> um, wasn't aware of how long it could take. So uh, we shall be posting that. But we did an example of some of our muscle testing procedures uh, there at our last health talk. Um, and so we will actually take this information that comes back from the blood work, and then we will begin with the muscle testing procedures. We're actually testing for um, muscle activation, muscle activation of muscles related to, to thyroid, to some of the other hormone uh, producing organs and glands and trying to then use the combination of the two pieces of information to identify specifically what is the nutritional deficiency or nutritional need for that person. Um, because you do have options, as we said, selenium and zinc for the activation of uh, T3 and that reverse T3 component. Um, tyrosine is uh, essential for the actual production of T3, T4. It is the essential amino acid needed for that, uh, that step. Uh, you also have iodine, as he mentioned earlier. It's called, it's even called T3 and T4, uh, based on the iodine amounts, which I didn't know that. Now I do. But uh, so therefore, um, so therefore, uh, iodine also becomes a crucial uh, possibility as well. There are a couple herbs uh, that are known as adaptogens that help in the production of hormones in the body. Ashwagandha is probably one of the more commonly talked about ones. Ashwagandha, uh, Tulsi. Um, so I want to use a lot. Um, we have another one called Indo Supreme, which I'm blanking on the name of that actual herb there. Uh, another one that I use too, just for the inflammation side of it, like Japanese knotweed, mm -hmm. Jista, mm -hmm. just to decrease the inflammation. Um, I'm not sure which one you're thinking of. Yeah, uh, Suma, Suma Root, which is what we call Indo Supreme, is the name of our product, is called Suma Root. Um, and then you also, um, yeah, for some reason, okay. So then, but then that brings us to another component, which is, so those are the kind of nutrition that we're gonna be looking for, and that kind of usually makes up your basic kind of structure to, to working with the thyroid. You wanna make sure those, those nutrients are available uh, for the thyroid to do what it needs to do. Your other component then does go back to the autoimmune component, which I'll actually send this over to Dr. Gabe, but looking at the food and um, some of the food factors that have to be looked at in terms of the autoimmune side of the thyroid. And this is a huge important part. Hashimoto's um, being the autoimmune disease most commonly associated with the thyroid. Uh, Graves is there, but it's a lot less common. Hashimoto's is the number one autoimmune disease currently in America. Millions are dealing with it or don't know they're dealing with it. Um, but what you see with that, just in the uh, side note of what the labs will end up looking like, when Hashimoto's starts going, you will see a kind of rise and fall of thyroid hormones. You'll get kind of a little bit of high or hyperthyroid, a little bit of hypo, and then finally after a while, your thyroid will be destroyed enough by the autoimmune process, it'll just be hypothyroid from there on. So running the blood labs definitely helps. And there's two other labs we haven't mentioned yet, and that's your thyroid peroxidase uh, antibody and your thyroid globulin. Antibody. And so we want to run those to see if there's any type of autoimmune process currently going on in the body. And that will give us a clue, okay, it's Hashimoto's and this is what we need to do to fix it. But the thing is, with an autoimmune complex, whatever they are, I always liken them to a pack of wolves. Um, when you get one, sure enough, there's going to be another one behind it. So each pack, each uh, wolf in the pack represents a different autoimmune disease. And people who have one are definitely more prone to others down the road unless the beginning process is stamped out. So autoimmune has 
its uh, origins in the gut. Uh, leaky gut syndrome, and anyone who's familiar with anything natural uh, health-wise will know about leaky gut. There's an article on our website that goes into ridiculous detail that I wrote up. If you want to get into it, there's some great resources on YouTube if you want to watch any lectures by Alessio Fasano. He's a medical doctor, I think, out of Boston University. He's the foremost researcher on this. Really fascinating stuff, but he does go into the deep details. But to give you an illustration, I always use a fortress or a castle. The castle walls are the cells that line your intestines. They are obviously to be in impenetrable except via the gates and things to allow things through. And we have the same thing inside our gut. There's ways for uh, nutrients and other things to get through, but they're gates. So only certain things are allowed in. The other thing is, is the moat that often goes around the castle, the big river or whatever. Um, we also have this mucus layer uh, that goes around our, that's why they call it a mucosal barrier, but a mucus layer that is outside our cells. And bacteria live in there, and they're good bacteria, usually, unless you have that issue too, which is a whole other topic that we won't really get into. But that moat can be destroyed, and the castle wall can be destroyed. So your cells will be destroyed. And now you'll have these big gaping holes where things can get through that should never get through. Gluten is the common example, and it's highly related to the thyroid. Most Hashimoto patients often are off gluten. Uh, but when gluten passes through, it's now in an area that it should never be. Gluten is a protein structure that should be broken down by our enzymes and our stomach acid and everything like that so that we can digest it properly. But when gluten passes through that barrier, the immune system sees it as a foreign invader, attacks it. And as this cycle of eating gluten and things like that creates more inflammation in the gut, that inflammation becomes systemic, head to toe. Soon enough, your immune system starts attacking any protein structure that's similar to gluten. We happen to have protein structures within our thyroid gland that are similar to gluten. That's why it's linked. And so you start cross-reacting and you'll start destroying your thyroid. There's other areas too, there's parts of your uh, kidney that have similar structures, and then your cerebellum and your brain. And there's a, another autoimmune complex called uh, gluten ataxia, which can cause a cerebellar destruction and people end up falling and being dizzy and vertigo and things like that. But this is how autoimmune starts. And I like what one guy, one doctor said, it's different manifestations of the same issue. And this is something we were even talking about Monday uh, in our health talk. So often we spend thousands of dollars on diagnosing something when in reality, all these diagnoses, diagnoses are the same thing or that have the same cause or same multiple causes. And so you spend all this time and, and effort to diagnose a problem when oftentimes the symptoms are where you should go for based on the common root cause of everything, which is food and microbes, infections, um, heavy metals and other environmental toxins, things like that, stress in your environment. Uh, food itself, so gluten is one common one. Milk is another one, specifically casein. That, that's a milk protein or a protein in dairy. Zane or the protein that's in corn. Uh, solanine is another one, which is the chemical or the toxin that uh, nightshade vegetables create to help protect themselves. And soy is soy. another common one. Soy is another big one with the thyroid gland too. Which soy has been touted as a health food. Let's please bring it down from the health food status. It is not a health food. In addition to causing thyroid problems in these individuals, it is also increases estrogen in your so, or at least it has a phytoestrogen inside it, so it acts as estrogen. So, just another fun thing with soy. Yeah. And I mean, come on, who wants tofu? Who wants tofu? So, so uh, yeah, so, that, so those are the kind of the workup, the breakdown uh, when it comes to uh, thyroid, thyroid issues, thyroid conditions. Um, that also really like kind of lays out our modes of working with it or, or treatment. 
again, we're able to be much more specific when we have that information and that knowledge that we're working off of when we're able to see the person and work with them directly. Um, yeah, and so it, it can be something that's very uh, manageable, managed, um, brought under control. We've seen a lot of people bring those hormone levels back to normal um, and therefore, and then, then the symptoms go with it, right? Symptoms go out the door with it. And so people are feeling that energy and feeling good again. And so again, it can take a little bit of time um, with, with some of those imbalances. It often they, those, especially the autoimmunity components take time and years to develop and to build to the point where you're actually seeing it affect the thyroid at that level. Um, so it can take some time. Which is always difficult in a culture of instant gratification where a pill is supposed to fix something which they never really do. <laughs> it's the same thing here. Rome wasn't built in a day. It's going to take time. There's going to be obstacles. You're going to fail. It's hard, but that's why we're here. Yeah. Um, perfect. So if there's any questions that anyone wants to send in or open up, uh, we'd love to answer those questions. We've got a couple of people saying thanks for the info, thanks for the information. Uh, we've really enjoyed and liked doing these. Um, we will continue doing them. We've had a lot of our clients even come back and and, and it's say thank you and appreciation for uh, the information being put out there. Uh, we love doing it. Uh, we continue to do it. We do health talks on a kind of monthly basis uh, there at Natural Grocers. Um, if there's ever requests in terms of topic matter, uh, health concern, um, we will we'll take that request and, and go with it. Um, if there's ever requests for the Facebook Lives that we do, we would love to uh, to talk about those things as well, um, as well as we're always open to doing different presentations um, in specific groups or areas or those kind of things. And so we even had someone at our health talk the other night um, talking about the possibility of um, presenting uh, with, a, with a group that they work with, and, and we would love to do that as well. So Also, we're just kind of big nerds. Like, there's probably patients that want us just to shut up and just want to talk about that stuff. And I mean, we all sit here and chat all the day long yeah. about this information. Yeah. And I know most people are just like, just fix me. I don't care. But we really do love talking about it. We love just throwing around ideas, theories, where these things come from, and just learning about it. Yeah. So thank you so much for everybody that joined us today. Um, and we hope to see you again next week, um, next Wednesday. Anita. Yeah.